this is a workshop uh, six lecture um, and in this lecture uh, I'm going to talk to you about programming uh, for STEAM activities uh, using problem-based pedagogies um, and the emphasis of this um, particular workshop is on industry connected learning so um, one of the things I'm going to talk about is how uh, how we can connect with industry um, as we are thinking about ideas for um, for learning with children across the STEAM topics. Um, and so I want to thread all those things together as I talk through these ideas. Um, I'm using screen grabs um, of pages on the web that I've uh, resourced. Um, and that's because I was going to give you a wonderful walkthrough with the web uh, pages, but the volume of um, little videos and animations that were in all the it, all, that were in all the uh, pages just kept making a uh, quick time crash. So I'm sorry I've had to do like screen grabs, but hopefully, as I talk through them, you'll get a sense of. Um, how effectively they can, um, you know, how effectively they can help you program, uh, and it will give you some ideas of where to go. So um, let's have a look at the uh, aims of what I'm going to talk about today, or the content. Um, so industry connected pedagogy is is really um, going to be a central part of what you do as an early childhood educator. And that's because um, you you must rely on the expertise of the of the world around you. It's it's um, an impossible job to try and do by yourself. Um, and so um, it, it it is actually really important to connect with other experts in the field and to draw on that um, as you go about your teaching um, and certainly your programming. Um, so. What's important, though, is to sift through the information that's out there. There's, there's just so much out there in the world, and particularly uh, on the web, of course. So it's important to know the good from the bad. Um, and um, it's, I'm going to try and show you some sites whereby you will um, uh, start to rely on a little bit more. And as you become more practised, as an educator, you will start to understand the good from the bad. Um, so my advice to you is as you find resources or find web links and things like that, and you know you would like to go back to them, use tactics um, for saving um, and filing those uh, links. Um, you can use all kinds of things. You could use a Google Doc um, or a um, Web Clipper program or if you um, have a notes function like on your phone, for example, um, I know in um, uh, the notes on phones, if you've got an iPhone, that translates across all other kind of Apple devices. Um, and so there are, um, yeah, there, there's ways to actually share these uh, or keep these, these things um, safe. Um, and for future reference. And this is different to having a profile within a specific program um, because then you have to go into that specific program. So it's good to have a, a place where everything gets collected from different platforms and you can actually rely on them uh, uh, on finding that quickly. Um, prior to searching on the web, it's really important to begin with the framework documents because uh, searching through the web is fine, but your aim is not to entertain children as a parent um, or as a, a babysitter. Um, you, are, you are an educator and therefore the purpose is to give children a really well-rounded and high quality education in connection to the framework documents that have been devised for Australian for the Australian sector. Uh, you know by now that there are framework, there's one framework, the EYLF, that overarches all um, of Australia. Um, and then states and territories have their own additional framework documents. <clears throat> so so uh, first and foremost is to begin with the national framework and then the framework within your um, state and territory as applies to, to you. Um, and we'll look at those in a moment. So, and then finally is to think about <clears throat> uh, 
the quality control that you apply to the resources and how you become quite focused in that and how you're able to tell the good from the bad. Um, and one of those is to think about the purpose of the resource that you're looking at. What's its what's its purpose? Um, and so uh, it's about going to sites whereby uh, it's connected to industry rather than commercialization. Um, and so um, finding finding sites where people don't really benefit, uh, they don't get a personal gain, if you like, from the resource. Um, so that's uh, why looking at the resources generated by educators is good or by education uh, systems is good. But then the um, also who, who are actually who are actually kind of not benefiting in terms of, um, for example, institutional um, providers like museums and so forth. Uh, it's very different from the um, from the aims of somebody who is selling a commercial product for profit, um, and so it's not to say that they're bad things, but the motivations for those products is very different. Um, it's uh, with the purpose of making money, so you want to try and avoid really relying on those types of things rather than things that are genuinely focus primarily on children's education and the other thing to avoid is the um, licensed based products so they're the things that sell um, movies um, animation companies characters um, yeah so so parents and families will not appreciate that licensing presence I certainly wouldn't if I was sending my young child to an early childhood center I would not want them to come home uh, bombarded with all that stuff that's out in the world already um, try to keep the ideas and activities as lice uh, well just non-licensed just avoid them uh, because that it's not the space for that in the early childhood center um, so you need to you need to avoid those at all costs, and so um, it's not, again it's not to say that those products are bad. It's just they're not right for this particular context, which is um, the early childhood sector. Okay, so let's start with the framework document. Uh, this is the national one, the um, uh, EYLF, and this is the one you start with because it overarches everything. It's, it's this is the kind of first base. It's it's the one that informs the state and territory ones. So you must go to that first. Um, and the uh, the reason why I've put the contents page up is because the contents page um, is actually a really good kind of overview of the detail that's in the framework. Um, so it's really handy to have um, around as you are sifting through uh, resources and possible ideas um, and you can kind of be reminded of the learning outcomes and the indicators which are here listed under the outcomes um, that um, are uh, shaping the ideas, the curriculum ideas and activity ideas that you might be uh, devising. Um, and so you must start with these first. So don't get an idea and go, oh, what would this fit to? Um, you know, in your planning uh, stages with uh, other staff, you will devise the program. And so you might, for example, be looking for um, uh, outcome one indicator um, three, uh, children develop knowledges and confident self-identities, for example, and um, outcome four, um, the last indicator, children resource their own learning through connecting with people, place, technologies, and natural and process materials. So you've got those two things together, and they then start to shape um, your analysis of the activities that you're resourcing. Do, does this activity that I've found on the web actually attend to those two indicators? So you must start with the framework first. Um, and so you select um, the uh, learning outcomes um, and you think about how to achieve them. What's informing all of that, though, is the principles and practice. So by now, you should be quite familiar with the principles and practice that inform the EYLF. 
which it means um, let's take a really kind of um, simplistic um, example so the principles and practice are about children's agency you know and the and the kind of theories of learning that are embedded within the within the framework uh, they're not about uh, children sitting still and listening and being told everything so children as passive so the activities that you're sourcing even though you're going outcome one indicator three and outcome four indicator four whatever um the 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 approaches to the activity mustn't be children just sitting and being told so um uh, you know, think about how the principles and practice of the ideas that you're looking at not only attend to the outcomes and indicators, they uphold the principles and practice of the uh, of the framework. So you have to take all of that along with you as you're sifting through the web for ideas. OK, so uh, and you need to kind of keep the contents page or your your um, planning documents that you've devised with your uh, colleagues at the center um, handy so that you can you can um, quality control or analyze the the, the um, relevance or the quality of the activities that you're looking at so if we then go to the um, contents page of the Victorian framework this again um, which is on the right of these two images you can see here the vision and purpose is actually um, is listed and then the principles so again these are the things you must learn and must remember and must reread to to ensure you really know them before you then go to the outcomes now you can see here because this is state-based uh, framework it mirrors the outcomes of the national framework because it sits underneath um, and so they are very set well, they are the same actually um, but the principles and practice or the, the purpose and practice um, they are the things that are particular to Victoria so they've been devised to be specific to Victoria to the nature of the Victorian context um, and then on the left I've included the kind of theories of learning or theories of childhood that inform the Victorian uh, framework which is Bronfenbrenner's uh, ecological model okay so again if your center uses this framework most um, predominantly then as just as I mentioned before as you're going through the web and searching for activities you must be mindful of whether the, the activities uphold Bronfenbrenner's uh, ecological model so it's this series of influences and requirements that start to help you quality control and select the appropriateness of one activity over another. Um, and so you can kind of understand why you'll start to go back to different sites that are more trustworthy and higher quality because they've been devised by other educators with these similar principles in mind. Okay, so you start to kind of move away from the commercial sites which are really just about selling a product um, and you'll start to see quite clearly what's quality and what's just a little bit of happy happy activity that a child could do at home you know for, for just pure pleasure or whatever all right so uh, one place if you don't already know which is a surprising spot for a lot of people is Pinterest so Pinterest is a digital pin board. Um, it is used hugely by teachers. <laughs> um, many teachers have their own Pinterest site. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, you can search for it um, via the web. It has an app function as well. Um, and you can, it's essentially like a digital version of a great big pin board that you would pin uh, you know, like postcards, a handwritten note to a photograph, some children's work, a curriculum document, all these different things. OK, so it's a kind of digital version of that. Um, and um, in Pinterest, you can do you can set up your own profile and you can have uh, different boards with um, topics. So you can have as many of these as you want. 
Um, and uh, you can also search the world of Pinterest for particular things. So I looked up um, STEAM, STEAM activities kindergarten. You can see there I've done a screen grab of the search. Um, you don't have to join Pinterest to search it. You can actually just go in and have a look. So you just, um, uh, you can go in there and um, you can click on, um, if, you, if you look at where my cursor is, e each of these images relates to a, a Pinterest kind of posting. Um, and you can click on that and it will expand. And then within that, there are other hyperlinks as well. But this is, um, this is a spot where teachers really, really love to go because it is a, a space where they can keep ideas and share ideas. Um, you can follow people on Pinterest and when they put new stuff up, um, you will get a notification in your um, email to say, um, you know, person X has made new postings. Um, and there are people who take Pinterest quite seriously. So teachers really do put a lot of effort into gathering um, incredible resources. So it is one that I trust um, and it is a it is a really, really good. Um, it's a really good site. Now, one of the reasons is if you look at this one, um, uh, the um, homeschooling um, community uh, uses Pinterest quite extensively to share resources and ideas. And that's because they're often parents um, homeschooling their children. So, you know, it's uh, you still have to sift a little bit. Um, but uh, generally speaking, these are these are ideas by people working in your in your field. So it's a very, it's a real favourite for teachers and, and kindergarten educators. So if we go into, just imagine I've clicked on one of these squares um, and uh, this is one of the, this is one of the ones I clicked on, STEAM Nature Activities for Children. Um, and it takes you to a site and as you scroll down, um, this is what you'll see further down. Uh, and there's videos, um, there's all kinds of things. They, um, and these are, so what, what it is, these are also built by teachers. So this particular site is built by a kindergarten teacher who's built her own website on, on things that she does in her classroom and things that she's gathered from other sites as well. So um, if this was a live image, these would be hyperlinks and this is all um, hands-on projects for kids and so you can see here uh, the quality of, of things that are um, that are really going to be great for the kindergarten space and it's all industry connected learning so I really like this idea of sky science why does the sky change colors um, that's a really big question that is often very difficult to answer. And we know that children ask big questions about science and life. Um, and so um, I thought, wow, that's a great one because kids do often say, why does the sky change color? And how would you, rather than just providing a verbal answer, um, I took some screen grabs of um, uh, how to help explain to children about uh, why the sky changes color um, and it, this is a jar full of um, milk and water and it's about particles it explains how particles and the light that falls through particles changes not the sky but actually the atmosphere so it's the atmosphere that we're looking at um, rather than the sky itself but we understand it popularly as sky so really great experiments that you can do. Um, also here, going from the same page, is simple, <coughs> uh, simple STEM challenges for young children. Uh, so you can just fall down a rabbit hole. You can just follow and follow and follow all these different, um, these different uh, links that have come from Pinterest, okay? So they, it, it's really good and you can, they each have their own URL link and this is why it's really important to have a, a spot where you can keep all these because sometimes you forget, you know, you forget where you've found things. So this one is um, using um, the light uh, table 
with um, kind of commercially available uh, party drinks um, glasses, but the plastic ones that are in different colours and they're often really bright. But if you layer them and construct them, you get some nice kind of colour theory uh, going on and um, prisms and all this kind of stuff. And so, of course, that's science learning. Um, this little image here is about um, magnetism. Um, and so the teacher used the uh, magnet kits that came in there that, that, that were in the center. And she went around the center and found anything that was magnetic, any object like um, paper clips or um, ball bearings or anything, anything that had a magnetic aspect to it. And she froze with the children. She froze those things in ice cubes and then the children um, pulled the ice cubes out to test the magnetism through ice. So that's a really lovely science experiment. And then this tiny image here relates to how the children were tasked with building a rain shelter that was actually, um, uh, that was actually waterproof. So that's a nice little engineering um, technology based activity there. And, and lots of others here. So you could just keep going. There is such a wealth of stuff, all from going back into, into Pinterest. So it's really good. Uh, another one here is um, I've just given two screenshots to show you the types of resource that you will get when you look into these teacher-based resources. Um, noodle robots that actually move. I mean, it's just incredible what you can find through these through these resources so um these are um i think that says not 21 two so my youngest grandson aged two and a half and i decided to spend a little time over in the classroom so a two and a half year old can build a uh, a noodle robot that that works and so this is the next this is how the teacher has kind of helped build their site um, and um, um, and how you can actually follow the instructions and uh, make a noodle robot that actually moves which is fantastic and so these all come from um, industry this is industry connected this is the industry of, of uh, people working as kindergarten teachers as um, elementary teachers, primary teachers, um, and people who are um, people who are homeschoolers, but who have expertise. So that's the other thing as well. Uh, people who homeschool are often, um, you know, they have graduate degrees in engineering, science, maths, and so on, uh, and they use that knowledge to build um, ideas and incredible activities. So you know, there's there's um, there's millions of these ideas. So just to remind you um, is to kind of um, go back, look at the uh, framework that you're working to, looking at the planning that you've devised with your colleagues for the children and making sure, for example, you know, does, does this activity fit the indicators that I'm actually um, wanting to work with? Uh, well, it doesn't actually, but I'm gonna save this in my folder because this is a fantastic activity that I can do with my children um, next, you know, next month or whatever. So that's one form of industry connected learning. The next one is um, the actual, uh, the industry out of education, but connected to education. So I really like, I'm going to talk a little bit about children's museums at home because we are still living in um, very uncertain times um, in terms of the, the early childhood sector um, and participation and you know um, and the impacts of the pandemic so uh, which may come and go we don't we don't actually know at the moment uh, but needless to say um, social distancing is still impacting and affecting how we can actually go and uh, participate in these public spaces. And so this is a meta, this is a meta site. Um, this is, uh, an, and it's a US based one, but the beauty of um, the internet is it actually doesn't matter if you're in another country because um, 
a museum is a museum. <laughs> so you can actually go to any of these museums. Um, if uh, again, this is a screen grab, but this list, which you can just see the top of here, um, it scrolls down, down, down. And each of these is the hyperlink to the actual museum page. Um, and it gives a description, the types of uh, museum that it focuses on. And then there's links here that are to their um, social media sites. So you could just go and follow them on Facebook or um, uh, what's the other one? Instagram or Pinterest or whatever. So, um, but they are all children's museums. And um, it's a, a really phenomenal um really phenomenal um, program um, and um, I will also put the web link into the um, the page um, on um, Canvas um, and uh, so that you can go and find it directly okay so I will put that one it'll be underneath the lecture this the, this little lecture image so if, uh, I did scroll down and I had a look at um, I, I opened one um, and this one was the um, California Bay, I think, or the San Francisco Bay, the Bay Area Museum. Or, uh, yes, Bay Area Museum, I think, um, in San Francisco. And um, this was a children's museum that is for um, STEM. Um, and it's a discovery museum. And so what I did was uh, I went into the um, main page and I clicked on, you can see here where I've clicked on research and resources and the um, the pop down, drop down menu had different things and I clicked on the word resources, which is here. Um, and so it's here, each one of these is also a hyperlink. So it's library staff, parents and any adult that works with children age zero to 10. So you'll find research-backed activities, tips, toolkits, and more. And so this is where this is the other aspect of industry that you should definitely um, that you should definitely um, explore. In Australia, we have like CSIRO; they have children's resources as well. Um, we have our um, science museum, the National Museum in Canberra. We have the um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Resource uh, Research Centre also in Canberra. Um, we have um, the Immigration Museum. We have the Sydney Museum, the Melbourne Museum. We have uh, the Powerhouse. I mean, the list goes on. So um, you can go into these websites of these places and actually search through for their um, resources and uh, online. And many... the one of the positives, I guess, of the pandemic situation is that many of these spaces scrambled to put online resources into their websites, which they are not going to remove. So an incredible kind of um, thing happened as a, re as a result of the uh, social distancing and isolation, um, whereby these... Um, these places that are normally really busy and open had to close and then had to think about connecting with their audiences. So uh, any museum that you know of, just head in in Australia into their website and search for their online content. So this, all of these, um, uh, all of these connections, this one here, I've just missed it off the image. But this one is uh, STEM for preschoolers. Um, and so really that's, that's all um, I'm going to talk about today. But um, it's just really to remind you that industry connected learning is really important for STEM. Um, and it's really important to help build the resources that you pull on and your um, bank of ideas. So um, I haven't... I, I, I haven't especially tried to generate um, unique resources for a very long time um, because there's so many great things out there um, for, for early childhood educators to, to use and to adapt, um, to change, um, you know, so, so really do rely on this and just make sure that before you go out there and wander about in the, in the digital field, that you are actually 
um, doing really great work with the framework documents first and ensuring you know exactly what the principles and practices are that you are upholding as you want to devise these activities. Thanks.